tonight is Amanda uh, Downham. Uh, Amanda is the author of the uh, Necromancer Chronicles, The Drowning City, uh, The Bone Palace, and Kingdoms of Dust, published by Orbit Books, and Dreams of Shreds and Tatters from Solaris. Her short fiction has appeared in Strange Horizons, Realms of Fantasy, Weird Tales, and elsewhere. She lives in Austin, Texas. Her day job sometimes involves dressing up as a giant worm. <laughs> okay, uh, Amanda, please. Good evening. So tonight I am reading the beginning of a forthcoming book called The Poison Court, which is a return to the setting of the Necromancer Chronicles, or at least the world. And this is an abridged version of the first chapter, which I'm hoping will fit in my reading slot tonight. If I run long, just start throwing grapes at me. <laughs> no one had died in a royal ball in over a year. Sibetra Severos held that thought like a pearl in her mind as she surveyed the tourmaline ballroom. It might reassure her eventually. The musicians played a stately low dance while couples drifted across the inlaid marble floor. The air was heavy with the heat of bodies, fragrant with wine and flowers, candle wax, and a dozen perfumes. Chandeliers scattered prisms of light throughout the hall, gleaming on silks and gems. Those guests not dancing clustered around the edges of the room, bright as butterflies in new spring finery. There had been a time when Saavedra had enjoyed parties, when dance, dancing and gossip and flirtation were careless fun, with nothing more to fear than the barbed wit of her fellow courtiers. Tonight, she stood in a corner of the hall, a glass of wine warming in her hand, while she studied the crowd, wondering how many of them might wish the king, or the queen, or herself dead, wondering how many were willing to take steps. Life had been so much simpler before she became a royal mistress. You shouldn't frown so, Varus Severo said, leaning against a column beside her. You look as though you were at a funeral, not a ball. He eyed an elaborate headdress of silk orchids swaying across the room. A funeral for taste. But cheer up. He plucked a wine glass off a passing tray and drained half in one swallow. A wealth of rings flashed on his narrow hand. Sapphire and emerald and ruby, stones that marked a mage. Fashions will change. And anyway, no one's died at a royal ball. In over a year, Sabedra sighed. You're such a comfort. As she exhaled, the folded parchment tucked into her bodice dug, dug into her skin. A message written in the slanting hand of Christoph Farga, the man who would be appointed court mage tomorrow. Halakis Sabedra, it read. I ask a moment of your time this evening, or a dance. I have an important matter to discuss with you. She scanned the room yet again, but found no trace of Farga's black-clad height amongst the crowd. Where is he anyway, she muttered. We're supposed to be celebrating his appointment tonight. Varus arched a painted eyebrow, celebrating the fact that the king has finally stopped dragging his feet and has accepted his father's choice with poor grace. By now, the whole court knows that Farga is like a hideous tapestry inherited from a great aunt unwanted, but unable to be parted with. He drained the last of his glass. Wherever he is, I'm sure the wine is better. Savedra shot him a sidelong glance. She couldn't refute the truth. Choosing Farga as the, as the successor to the former court mage had been one of King Lithiros' final acts, and while Nikos had spent his adult life trying to be nothing like his father, he couldn't bring himself to deny the appointment. In the last year, neither Nikos nor Saavedra had found a better candidate. Varus had steadfastly refused from the beginning. It would have been easier if she were fond of Farga, but though no one doubted his thaumaturgical credentials, he was cool and brittle in his pride, with a wry, caustic wit that scathed more often than it amused. Saavedra knew she ought to build a rapport, but every time she tried, his chilly reserve put her off all over again. Varus's eyes narrowed cool as cobalt glass. You don't have to like the man, he said, as though he could hear her thoughts. 
But if you're worried about trusting him, he shrugged. I can't fault his training, and he's ambitious. I doubt he'll find a better offer. And I'll be present tomorrow when he swears his oath of fealty, if that's any comfort. All the more reason we should have gone to the fourth Gorgon tonight. You'd have more fun with my set than this one. Savitra raised her glass to cover another sigh, a frown to find it empty. The wine was a southern white, perfectly acceptable despite Varus' aspersions, but it had been better an hour ago when it was still chilled. Nikos needs me here. <coughs> But if whatever Fargo wants to discuss is so damned important, I wish he'd get on with it. He can't actually want to dance. I hope he's not planning to blackmail me. She meant it as a joke, but the words sent a cold worm of unease coiling through her stomach all the same. If she had only one secret worth extorting, she would be ruthless in protecting it. Shall we dance? Varus asked. I might as well cement my reputation as a saddled man who holds up a wall and only dances with his niece. You dance. I'm going to find Fargo. Eyes followed her as she crossed the hall. A few disapproving glances, a few jealous ones, some merely curious. <coughs> She'd been stared at since she first came to court. She had worn scandal long before Nikos had ever given her pearls. Goose flesh crawled across Savedra's limbs as she stepped onto the terrace. The gardens were green with spring, but the night air was still raw, and the layered gossamer of her gown did little to hold out the chill. Light streamed from high windows, striping the lawn with amber and citrine. Lanterns swayed among the trees, hidden and revealed in turn by shifting veils of leaves. Sighs and giggles drifted from the darkness of the hedges. No evening chill with dwarf couples determined to sneak a tryst on the palace grounds. The moon was a waning sliver above the domes of the Azure Palace. Its light cast a scant silver glaze across the lawns, gleaming on crushed gravel walks. Somewhere in the trees an owl cried. A shiver that had nothing to do with the weather crept over Savedra's nape. She couldn't stop the prayer that rose in her mind. The black mother turned her face. Owl-winged Arishal rarely listened to such entreaties, which reminded her the last time she'd wandered into a maze at a garden party, she'd nearly been shot. The Gorgon Fountain stood at the center of the Azure Palace's largest hedge labyrinth. Honeysuckles perfumed the night, coy in their profusion. As she neared the entrance, a dark-cloaked figure fled the path. Not tall enough to be Farga, too slight. A woman? Savedra guessed from the light steps and rustle of fabric. But darkness and the hooded cloak hid even the color of her gown. An uneasy chill stirred in her stomach. Perhaps she ought to have waited for her uncle. But she knew these grounds well, and the silver and ivory sticks in her hair served as weapons in a pinch. Gravel crunched beneath a boot as she reached the entrance to the hedge. A man darted out, clipping her shoulder with his and sending her stumbling into a wall of leaves. He reached out to steady her, a gesture that seemed more instinctive than concerned. His breath caught as if he would speak, but instead he turned and bolted across the lawn. Had he been the woman's companion in the hedge? She didn't think she'd seen him before. He wasn't dressed for the ball. A servant or an interloper? The shadows take it. She'd gone over security three times. The unsettled feeling grew inside her. She drew a curved stick from her hair. She hated to undo her maid's work, but the ivory was solid and reassuring against her palm. She met no one else save for silent statues as she wound through the hedge. At least it was a labyrinth and not a maze. The path curved inexorably toward the center. Beyond the final wall of shrubbery lay a curved circular clearing. The crunch of gravel underfoot gave way to the scuff of soft soles against flagstones. Moonlight silvered the water jetting from a marble statue, lined the limbs and writhing hair of the gorgon from whose death wound the water flowed. She reclined in Beshaman's arms, her lover and killer, his face lost in darkness. The fountain was properly named for him, but it was the gorgon whom everyone remembered. Now, Nearly invisible in the shadow of the basin, a third figure joined the tableau. Savedra nearly overlooked the sprawl of limbs and black cloth. A 
a few more steps and she would have tripped over it. A dark stain glistened on the stones, thinning in the spray. She drew a breath to dispel her sudden dizziness. When her vision cleared, she crouched beside the fallen man. He lay face down, but she guessed his sex from the long, bony-knuckled hand curled against the ground. Rings glittered on his third and middle fingers. Over the scent of honeysuckle and whetstone, she smelled blood and urine. Whatever saints or spirits or heathen gods ruled over the dead, they spared them no dignity. She scrubbed sweat slick palms on her skirt before carefully touching the back of that outflung hand. The feel of dead flesh was unmistakable, had the smell not been enough. His tendons were locked sharp and rigid. Cool, but not yet as cold as the night. The breeze drifting over her shoulder carried the scent of lime and lilac, enough warning that she didn't startle when the shadows peeled back to reveal Varus. Damn, I knew it couldn't last. His tone was dry, even bored, but he twisted his rings around bony fingers as he spoke. I often suspect the Arcanos leaves half these cor corpses lying around to justify the Crown Investigator's budget. A spark flared in the Pod Paraj sapphire on his left hand, the only sign of his spellcasting Saavedra could detect. An instant later, an answering pink glow rose in the blood that stained the ground. The light unfurled like a spider's web between the flagstones around the dead man. The blood is all his, he said, banishing the glow as easily as he'd invoked it. In its place, he summoned Witchlight, a pale rose-tinged sphere that hung steady as a well-trimmed lamp over the corpse. Saavedra turned away in time to save her night vision. A proper investigator would make all manner of fussy observations before disturbing the scene, he continued, but I would rather satisfy my curiosity. Turn him over, won't you? She glared at him, but took the corpse by the shoulder and heaved. His limbs were still pliant, the stiffness of death not yet set in. The smell of blood and waste wafted stronger, tinged with another blended oil, pine and musk this time. Not as familiar to her as her uncle's sense, but recognizable all the same. Her stomach tightened with sick certainty. The dead man's head lolled against her knee. The light spilled over the lean, sharp-boned face of Christophe Farga. What was left of it, anyway.